Welcome everyone, they call me Intra Checkout, and when someone buys a AAA video game, they feel a certain amount of investment. After all, no one wants to waste money, and we all very much like to get our money's worth. Virtually no one will buy a game for $60 only to throw it in the trash within half a minute of playing. This of course is not the case in Dreams. In Dreams you have endless content available to you, ranging from abysmal to incredible in pretty much a 9 to 1 ratio. This makes players incredibly impatient. If your dream does not impress within the first 20 to 30 seconds, chances are that most people are just going to skip it. That's why it's important to create good first impressions and dreams, and a certain amount of polish is therefore required. Now of course, no amount of polish is ever going to make something bad good, but it can make something average above average. That's why in this video I wanted to go over some things that may help you elevate your game or scene to that next level. Some of it will just be genuine tips and tricks, but I also wanted to throw some general opinions out there, just ideas you might want to keep in mind when creating content in dreams. It will all be heavily based in subjectivity though. None of my tips are rules, they're just guidelines that align with my personal preferences. If you also have anything that you see often in dreams and annoys you or makes you quit them, I'd like to hear it as well. Now let's get into it. The first easy way you can make your dreams feel more professional is by not using the default text displayer look when having text on screen. I can't really express why, but that standard text box just looks very boring. I think it mainly has to do with rounded corners. Also, the black text is quite unusual. I quickly checked for some popular games and they all used white or other light colored text for the UI, tutorial messages, etc. So what would look better instead of the standard settings? There are multiple solutions, but first of all, get rid of the rounded corners and also the border if you don't need it. There are two styles I gravitate towards. One is a dark and slightly transparent text box with light colored text on top of it, and the other is just light colored text with no text box or border at all. It's really that easy to improve the look of your UI. This doesn't mean there's anything wrong with black text. It can easily look professional as well, and in some cases it's necessary because the scene itself is already really bright. Just getting rid of the rounded corners already makes it look two times better most of the time. Next thing that ruins a lot of scenes. The skybox. I made an in-depth video on creating a cloudy sky, but in it I forgot to mention one of the most important settings you need to take a look at when creating a scene. The fog range. So many scenes have this transparent look for objects in the distance, and it often doesn't look good at all. This while it's actually quite easy to solve this problem. Just stamp a sun and sky gadget in your scene and edit the fog range to make it the highest possible. 10,000 meters. Unless you have made a huge scene, the transparent effect should be more or less completely gone at this point. Talking about the skybox, I also recommend making the flex type for it number 4, 6 or 12. This makes the flex barely noticeable and gives the sky a more uniform look as a result. The default round shaped flex are in my opinion pretty much the worst of them all. Also, you might want to increase the sky brightness in daylight scenes, because it has a far bigger influence on the lighting in your scene than the sun brightness. Also also, the sun brightness should pretty much always be 100% in outside scenes. The standard sun often makes daylight scenes feel really dull. I went into this a bit in both my cyberpunk apartment video and the one about creating the cloudy sky. But I might even do another video on skyboxes, as there are just a lot of things to discuss. Another slightly annoying thing I will often encounter is slow walking speed. I understand why people do this, because reducing the walk speed is a great way to make players pay more attention to the work you've put into the environment, while simultaneously artificially increasing the runtime of your dream. Unfortunately, like mentioned earlier, players really have no patience at all in dreams, and forcing them to walk really slowly through a scene doesn't help. A slight workaround is to give players a sprint button. By giving them control over the speed, they will subconsciously feel slightly faster even if they're not. Still, it's better to just leave the walking speed at a reasonable setting and let players explore at their own pace, even if that means they can rush through your game within a minute. This brings me to the topic of characters, specifically first person ones. I will often say dreams made with first person characters created by the dreamer himself or by the community. Now there's of course nothing wrong with this, but if you just have a first person character with no special mechanics or animations, it's silly to not just use the one media molecule made. Especially because that one has often way more solid controls. Still on the topic of characters, it's also not unusual to see characters that you can possess and depossess while this shouldn't be the case. This is certainly not something that makes people quit, but it's just a really easy problem to solve. 
Most of you watching will probably know this by now, but if you didn't, if you tweak the controller sensor in a puppet, you can activate force possession, and if you don't want players to be able to leave, delete the wire that leads from the circle button to depossess. You can of course also prevent players from being able to possess it in the first place. A problem that comes up a lot, but this time doesn't have an immediate apparent solution, is one of optimization. Often I will start up a dream and get presented with a beautiful scene, only for it to turn into a blurry mess after pushing the right stick to the side. Sometimes this is because of motion blur. Motion blur, as far as I'm concerned, is just a big no-no when creating games, because it makes looking around and focusing on specific things a total mess. If you want to get rid of as much motion blur as possible, you can place a grade and effects tool in your game and set motion blur to zero. More often than not though, motion blur is not the reason why a dream feels bad to play but frame rates. Here's the thing, it doesn't matter how beautiful a game is, if it's unplayable because of a horrible frame rate, people will just not play it. The best advice is really to just keep this in mind when creating dreams. If you playtest your level and it doesn't feel good to play, you'll just have to delete some of the more crazy stuff until it does get to a playable state. But I do have some more advice. First of all, if you didn't know, you really should know about the optimization tool in the tools menu that optimizes the graphic side of the thermometer. If you select this tool, you can increase or decrease the detail in individual sculpts in your scene. This tool is basically something you have to use every single time you stamp a community-made asset in your dream, because the community is currently really bad at optimization. Now it looks like you're just increasing or decreasing the looseness of sculpts by using this tool, but no, you're actually not. Looseness has zero effect on the thermometer. I sure wish it did though, because if it did, we could optimize the graphic side of our games by making the sculpts more detailed the closer you are to them. Anyway, we can't. This does mean though that if you want a certain sculpt to be more loose, it's better to use the optimization tool than to change the looseness with the style mode. Another point I wanted to make about optimization is that the graphics part of the thermo doesn't scale linearly with the amount of a certain object in your scene. Let me elaborate with an example. If you stamp a sculpt into your scene and make it extremely detailed, you can expect it to take up like 20% graphics. Now if you clone this extremely detailed object, how much do you think those will take up in total? Intuitively it seems like 40% would be the answer, but in reality it's still 20%. What this basically means is that you can get away with more detailed scenes if you just use fewer different sculpts. This is the reason why some indoor scenes created by dreamers can look so tight. They use a lot of the same assets, allowing them to increase the detail to a really high level. None of this actually addresses the gameplay though. Graphics don't really have an impact on frame rates, or at least not one that I could detect. Logically, I thought that the gameplay side of things does. The gameplay part of the thermo is mainly influenced by the amount of different things in your scene. The more you clone a sculpt, add logic, paint strokes, the more the gameplay thermo will fill up. After doing some testing, however, it seems like the amount of objects in your scene also barely has an influence on the frame rate. What instead seems to be the leading cause of slowdown in people's dreams is physics. If you have a lot of puppets walking around, physics objects or foliage that reacts to wind, your scene can quickly turn into an unplayable mess, even if you're nowhere close to the limit of the thermo. In my arena of Disco Dream, for example, the absolute maximum amount of enemies that I could have in the scene at once without setting my PS4 on fire was 5. Which is quite disappointing, because I obviously wanted to have the ability to create huge battles with like 60 enemies at the same time. I still silently wish that Media Molecule finds some way to optimize the crap out of puppets, but there's a big chance that this is just a reality we have to deal with. Still, we will probably find a workaround anyway. The next thing I wanted to mention in this video is tutorials. This is a huge problem we face in dreams. Almost every dream has different controls and we have to start the process of learning them every time we start playing a new dream. Considering then that most playable dreams have a runtime of about 5 minutes max, it's understandable that some players might skip your level if they are met with a huge list of buttons and mechanics the moment they start playing your dream. It's a painstaking process to slowly run down the list, testing what does what, only to forget about it in the heat of battle. Still, this is the way a lot of dreamers will go about it. And to a certain extent, this is not something you can solve. There is no magical way in which you can teach the player your game in an instant. That however doesn't mean there are no things you can do to lessen the risk of people quitting your dream. First of all, I recommend trying to go for a really strong opening to your dream. It doesn't need to be anything fancy, just something of quality that makes the player so interested that they want to stay in your game to find out what happens next. You can do this using dialogue, cutscenes, humor, really anything that makes a player feel some sort of attachment to your dream. About tutorials themselves, 
I think it's best to not show the player every single mechanic and corresponding button press at the beginning of your game, all at the same time. And by the way, I'm totally guilty of this as well, so I don't blame anyone for doing it, but there are just better ways to teach the player the game. I recommend to try to make some sort of obstacle course that teaches the player the mechanics while he, well, plays, instead of making the tutorial almost like a laundry list of work you have to do before getting to the good stuff. This is maybe not a realistic request if you're making a one of type game, but if you're like me and have put a lot of work into a single character that you plan to use for different games, it's really nice to be able to tag this obstacle course to any future projects. Because my FPS character is a template for the community, I've made my tutorial scene, called Test Range, public so anyone can use it and add to it for their own games. It's of course also possible to integrate the tutorial into the game itself, instead of making it a separate thing, like most games these days do. A last thing about tutorials. Players are smart and will figure out your game even without them. So in some cases it's maybe better to not create one, because the lack of it makes a game more interesting. So if you just throw the player into a fight or high stakes scenario immediately, like Doom 2016 or Overcooked, <laughs> they will also quickly learn how to play the game, but in a more natural and maybe even more fun way. Of course you can't make this first fight too hard though, or players will rage quit. But that's pretty much all I wanted to mention this video, so uh, I thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you around.